Good day. My name is Dave McAllister, and I'm a senior open source software technologist here at Nginx, which is part of F5. And today here at 90 Days of DevOps, I'm going to talk to you about um, the stats behind the alerts or what our data is actually telling us uh, when we see it coming in from our systems and our applications. But let's kick it off with a quick question. So what's the difference between a mean a median and a mode. Now, if you're like most people I ask this question to, most of you immediately think you understand what a mean is, probably around 90%. About 50% are pretty comfortable with understanding what a mode, a median means. And honestly, about 15% get what a mode is. But if you did get all of those, I have an extra credit question for you. What's the ninth data kind number? It was introduced just a couple of months ago, um, and I'll give you the answer at the end of this talk. So we're going to be talking about the stats, and that's all because, very honestly, monitoring is a numbers game. The metrics that we measure are the numbers that are re represent selected behavior, and they generally are time-stamped. They generally have key value pairs that are part of this. But for an application to make sense of this data, for a person to make sense of this data, we need to aggregate it. We need to be able to analyze it. We need to be able to usually visualize what our data is telling us. And that's because we have a huge amount of data being pumped at us all the time. It would be like trying to, to watch a tail minus F on syslog across all of the servers in AWS land all at the same time. You'd get a lot of data, but you'd not actually be able to focus on anything that's there. What you're looking at here is a speeded up chart of red, rate error duration, where the information a trace can tell us about what's going on inside of our application. So anyway, we have all these numbers. So let's think about a couple of questions that you may want to find some answers to. So first, how do you deal with outliers or the spikes? And remember, spikes can go down as well as up here. How do you build a representative value, statistically valid value, when the values build upon each other? And then how do you actually represent rate of change over time? So the question is really, do you know what your alert is telling you? Well, let's dive in and find out a little bit more. So here's a fairly straightforward data set. It's about, I think, 61 numbers long. And you know, the numbers that you can see them there. But when we break this down, a mean is the measure of central tendency, and it represents an average value of a set of data. And in this case, we could say the mean is 5.444. The median represents the middle value of an ordered set. And so in this case, median comes out to be six. And the mode represents the value that appears most frequently in a set of data. So remember the original question I talked about with what's a mean, a median, and a mode? Well, it's actually a trick question because that mean could be 5.444, or is it 4.130, or is it 2.791? And that's very honestly because there's not just one mean. We have arithmetic means, harmonic means, geometric means, trimmed means, weighted means, moving means, or double exponential weighted moving means, or double exponential weighted moving averages, if you will. Each of these things has its own use and a draw has its own drawbacks. They're usually already represented and implemented in your monitoring software. They can give you, as we just saw in that example before, very different results, but they can make like and unlike comparisons a lot easier. So arithmetic mean. This is the one that almost every one of you thought about when I said, what's a mean? It is the most common. Pretty much add the numbers together, divide by the, the count of numbers here, and you will get a central tendency value. It is the central point in a normal distribution curve, normal distribution curve, bell curve, um, whatever you want to call it here, but that is not necessarily the 50% mark. It is only the 50% mark if the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And we'll get a little bit more into that. 
and is very useful comparing current conditions to previous conditions in an aggregated sense. Again, remember data to be useful for us statistically has to be aggregated. And it's usually aggregated into time series, into groups that are based on time. And in a time series, we usually are constantly incorporating new data. Our systems moved so fast now that we can't afford to batch process all of our data. So using a simple example, load balancer. The load balancer is feeding requests to three systems. My systems are handling 100 requests per second, 200 requests per second, 300 requests per second. So my mean that is across these is 200 requests per second. So very simple. And if that number changes, we should be able to say, oh, look, that number just doubled and we know we're at 400 requests or we've dropped. And so we can get a, a comparison to what is the central tendency. When we move on to the next one, geometric, the geometric mean is a little more complex. Basically, multiply all those numbers together, take the nth root. And so multiply the numbers and take the root of uh, the number of numbers that you have here. In DevOps, we find this is heavily used for looking at things like deploys um, per unit of time or the lead time for changes or throughput. For instance, looking at here, our DevOps team is interested in optimizing the app development and deployment. In Sprint 1, they had a 5% reduction, 2 was 10, 3 was a 3%, 7. How well are they actually reducing the, the deployment times? Well, using a geometric mean, which is designed specifically to let us build upon the actual, actual functionality, these things build together. An arithmetic mean might be somewhat misleading because the improvements build upon each other or compound. A geometric mean allows us to understand the central tendency of a compounding element for this. And in this case, you can see that my improvements across the board, I have to get the, the values, I subtract them out, but my geometric mean works out to 0.937 or roughly that deployment has had a 6.3% improvement over those four sprints. Very useful when we're looking at, at how things build and improve upon each other. And then next up, let's take a look at harmonic. Harmonic is take the reciprocals of all the numbers, add them together, and then divide that answer into the number of units that you're working for here. And this is very useful because it allows us to not wait to the highest number, but it waits to the lowest number. So this allows us to figure out where our boundaries are. And so using that same load balancer solution from the arithmetic mean, you can see that the harmonic mean comes out to 150 requests per second. And if you flash back to the arithmetic mean, that number is 200 requests per second. And that's because harmonic mean is weighting 100 higher than 300, whereas arithmetic mean does the opposite and rates 300 much higher. DevOps usage is performance within range. Understanding these two values gives us not just um, the ability to look at a central tendency, but look at the range of central tendencies that are happening in there. And it is excellent at latency or throughput. Once again, things that are arriving at irregular times for that it is especially useful for outliers, because if we know that it's not inside of that range, then that range that's there, then it can be a real unique situation. So this allows clearer comparison to changes lower, maybe a misconfig, higher, what the heck changed, but it gives us a, a realistic viewpoint of server performance, right there, Semitic is giving us a realistic viewpoint of the um, server traffic. <clears throat> so here's a, a simple thing. This was actually brought up to me when I did this talk once before, and someone was curious about how they should measure these these things. They actually are a consultant and they go into to pitch their clients and they say, what I'm going to look at is a suggested mes metric of taking the average latency times the average number traffic counts per second coming in here. And that's going to be my centralized metric. 
But there's a problem with this. What's more important to the equation? Is it latency or is it throughput? Well, the interesting thing is that that description is the moral equivalent of the geometric mean. I just didn't bother to take the square root of it. But because it's possible to receive the same metric based on changes to those environments. And as you can see, 250 latencies per second times 40 uh, versus 200 times 50 or 400 times 25 all give me the same metric, yet they are very definitely different. These things are kind of challenging to think about. So think about it. Right now, what we're measuring this method is the moral equivalent of the geometric mean here. The arithmetic mean weights the larger number highest. And in this case, it's almost always going to be that latency number because we're comparing apples and oranges for here. The harmonic mean is always going to weight the lowest number the, the most because that average count is probably going to be less, but not always, less than my latency number. Again, apples and orange comparisons, or as one of my coworkers likes to say, comparing apples and toasters. And as you can see, it varies across the board. So geometric mean will give me a centralized viewpoint. It can also be very useful for comparing unrelated results. And so it will give me a balance point. So in the, this sense, the geometric mean is the centralized tendency of the centralized tendencies. So let's move on to median. Median is one of my favorite things amazingly underutilized. It bugs me every single time this. And if you flip back, it is the center value of a sorted list. If your list happens to be, be a set of even numbers, then you take the two centralized numbers, add them together, and take the arithmetic mean. That's the easiest way to do that. The median is always the 50% point of a normal curve if the data is in a normal curve. So you no longer have to worry about that, that mean is zero and standard deviation of one that's inside of here. Like all statistics, they're only valid once we've started moving into that aggregation viewpoint. And so here you can see a chart, and we can see that the first entry, there's of course not a mean, the mean is actually the single value. But over time, we can start seeing this. And as we get more and more into our, our environment, both of them start sort of balancing out. There's not a lot of changes between them. This is if you have a standard stable running system. And in this case, the mean is 25.25. When I uh, run it out to 37, 38, I've forgotten what the number is. And the median is 26. But what happens? When we have an outlier situation, so something like, you know, um, sales on Black Friday or a disk failure or uh, network latency or a noisy neighbor problem show up here. And all of a sudden, something jumps or decreases. What happens is that the mean is affected immediately by an outlier, especially a large outlier. In this case, my, my new value jumped to 250, whereas my mean was in that 25 range. In this case, I've run it out a little bit farther, 25.54. My median, on the other hand, changes by a single step. One outlier does not impact the changes in that environment. However, when it recovers, however, the mean does not immediately recover. It is still baking in that outlier. That outlier is incredibly important for your alerts, but you may want to know what happens when you have solved the problem. And the mean does not recover the same way. It will gradually tail back down to its stable state. The median immediately is recovered. There's only been a single digit move inside of this. So the median is not impacted. So the resilience is much higher in a median environment for that. And this is really useful in anomaly detection or response time monitoring, where we want to know what the response times are in stable environments. We want to know when there is an a alerts triggering functionality, but we don't want that alert to change the nature of what we're working with when we've recovered from this. So think about it this way. For sudden change, mean may be a better choice. We will see the sudden change up and down inside that. For things like historical anomalies, 
your media is probably a better choice. And this is very dependent on your time scale. If you had done this in the first five sections, the, the difference is very, very much less apparent because it has much less weighted factor to your mean. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I had mentioned this earlier on that the harmonic also does a similar balancing act here. In this case, the harmonic, if you notice, a different set of data, but my mean, my outlier has jumped tremendously. My mean changed pretty substantially. My median changed by a single uh, digit point right here. And my harmonic had just about the same changes. Harmonic is always less, but nonetheless, it's still there. So, by the way, if you're using what's known as P95, P90, P99, you're already using a percentage value just like median at P50 for that. Congrats. Great choice. Love it. However, there is a gotcha. All these things always come with a gotcha. Um, it's only now computers really can make use of things like um, geometric means, you know, finding the hundredth and first root of 101 numbers is non-trivial. It's probably not something you would want to do by hand. The um, uh, harmonic mean, we could probably do that by hand, but it's still a fair amount of work versus adding and dividing that. But the gotcha has to do with your data set. Think of it this way. Geometric mean, our numbers multiplied together. If one of my numbers is zero, all my result is zero. And it doesn't matter what my root is because I'm taking the root of zero to zero. Likewise, if one of my numbers is zero in a harmonic mean, I am taking the reciprocal of zero, which is by nature undefined. And therefore, I can't use this for any data set that has a zero in it. This means that it's really useful for things that you can either extract zeros from or things that naturally should not have zeros in them, such as latency or potentially even throughput, even though I can come up with cases where throughput could move to zero and cause you problems. So let's do a slight sidetrack though here, and that's around the measure of uh, variability. If I tell you that the median is 16, it doesn't give you a lot of information. But if I tell you that the median is 16 out of a range of 68, you now can start visualizing, start doing that internal visualization of what that means, where the weighted factors are, how much data is in one section or another. And so basically variability is all around how the numbers behave. And properly used variability, it lets you target outliers. And there are some others, standard deviation, range overall, interquartile range, variance clusters, and then outliers itself. And the picture you're looking at here is what's known as the interquartile range. The interquartile range basically says, take your numbers in order and find the 25th uh, percentile point, the 50th percentile point, and the 75th percentile point, and subtract the 75th percentile point from the 25th percentile point, and that gives you this thing that's known as a interquartile range. So that's the, the range that's centered around the central tendency point. So both standard deviation and IQ are actually fit best for understanding range, but there's a rule of thumb that can be really useful called the outlier formula. And this says that any points that are outside of one and a half times the IQR, the interquartile range, is a potential candidate for an outlier. And so in the data set using this, my IQR is that range between Q1 and Q3. My outlier formula is 50% larger than that. And if I add those two pieces to or subtract from Q1 and add to Q3, anything that falls outside of that range falls into this massively good candidate for an outlier. This is not statistically valid or proven. It's just a rule of thumb, but it's a very useful rule of thumb to help you understand the behavior of your analytics. 
So how about the mode, the last of those three pieces that we talked about? This is the most recurring number in the set, and it's usually presented as a histograph. It's not commonly used, believe it or not, inside of DevOps and um, necessarily an alerting basis. It's usually mostly inferential. And we'll see it in things like log analysis to identify and troubleshoot issues and systems. Mode can be useful in looking at the most common errors or the most common messages that are occurring in a system. Or in security monitoring to target the most common attack vectors being used against the service. You may drop into network traffic, you may drop into logs, but again, it will tell you what's happening the most often for that, or even in user behavior. And think of this in terms of, of seeing what's happening in patterns, how people are making use of it, what is their most common pathway through a system. And so mode is very useful, but it's in this inferential state. And of course, that leads us to sidetrack, descriptive versus inferential. I've just mentioned inferential. Descriptive uses the whole data set to draw a statistical conclusion. That original 61 items, I used every item inside of that. My items didn't add, didn't change over time, but I used every single one of them. And it's used for visualization, and it can be used to define exact trends. And it is a precise answer. There's no new data coming in. But we can't always do that. We can't go measure every single person in the world to find out a descriptive environment, for instance. And so we use inferential. And inferential is a sample set that's used to draw conclusions. And it's great for testing against uh, predictions or hypotenuse testing. It can also be used for visualization. But there's a nasty word in there, and it's called leads us to sampling. And if you recall, we did talk about how monitoring is now a data problem. And when we talk about observability, we talk about the three principal classes, metrics, traces, and logs, but there are events and there are all sorts of other things that have now crept into our, our nature of observability space. The analysis is usually aggregated and analyzed in segments or time defined in here. And therefore we have abilities to do sampling. The nice thing is that we're getting smarter about being able to do sampling, particularly um, in sampling for things of interest for this. But you can break this down into a couple of categories. There's random sampling or stratified sampling or clustered or purposive sampling. Purposive sampling, selecting the numbers of the population depending on a specified criteria or characteristic that's of interest, but we're only reducing it based on a certain set of knowledge. In observability, this is quite often uh, the difference between what's known as head-based sampling and tail-based sampling. And now we also have the ability to do filtered event uh, behavior inside of open telemetry. Great stuff, well worth your time in taking advantage of that. Over here on the first chart, I am looking at the errors per request coming in and I'm using a sampled approach. This is head-based sampling, which is purely random, by the way. I have decided before I see the trace that was coming in that I'm going to sample or keep that data for there. And you can see that it's showing very few errors. And at the same point in time, um, my latency distribution is showing that the 95th percentile is running one to two seconds. And I've got one trace that's that far out. When I look at the full data set, the no sampling approach here, I have errors creeping up all over the place. Not necessarily something I would have to worry about, but they're there. But my latency distribution now shows that my 95th percentile has a trace that's between 29 and 40 seconds. That's an unhappy user, very honestly. So sampling is giving me a selection bias. And when it's purely random, I don't even see the things that it's it's deciding to, to bias against here. And very honestly, 28 seconds in e-commerce is a loss sale. So don't worry about that. Sampling changes from descriptive, make use of all the data, to inferential. It can hide the outlier behavior. Fortunately, in most cases, metrics is not usually sampled. 
But when we start adding in all those characteristics between traces, logs, and metrics here, we can start finding out that we've got metrics that are telling us something to which there is no underlying data that has been preserved for them. Sampling is a necessary evil. We have a lot of data. You know, I, I've seen one um, company who does 46 terabytes of log files per hour. They added tracing to it and it went up to like 93 terabytes per hour. There's no nothing that's going to be able to keep up with that. We can't keep track of all that. We're going to run out of things. And so they have to get to a sampling approach. So it's a necessary evil, but understand what you are giving up particularly when you go to tail-based sampling, which is looking at the trace or the data at the end of the result and determining whether you want to keep it or not based on some criteria. So we've kind of covered the, the basics of that. But when we get into this, remember the back to that visualization thing. Generally speaking, we use distributions to help us understand the trends and patterns inside of our environments here. A normal curve, um, uh, otherwise known as a Gaussian distribution. This is your standard bell-shaped curve. It's the most commonly used one to model lead time, cycle times, where things show roughly symmetric distribution around of values around this. We can have Poisson looking at, at things that are rare occurrences, betas, otherwise known as A-B testing, or exponential time between asynchronous events, wavel, likelihood of failure, or log normal, values based on lots of things where the log may look like a normal distribution, even though the data itself does not. Sidetrack on standard deviation, though. What you're looking at here is your standard normal curve. Your normal curve has this wonderful bell shape. And it measures the variability of your data inside of that curve. So standard deviation for this will be within 68%. Your values will be there, 95% for two SDs, 99.7 for three. It is not actually a percentage-based number. It's possible to create one, honestly, um, coefficient of variability inside of here. But normal curves are heavily used in lead times or recovery times or looking at alerts or even in that SLO, SLI stays. So a normal curve is a very important thing, but it is not your only curve. Don't try to put things like um, latencies or response times to irregularly occurring events into a normal curve. It doesn't work. They have a very different structure. And in fact, the one you should be considering, especially for things like latency, rate, um, or, or throughput counts, here's this thing called an exponential curve. An exponential curve, by, by the way, is actually looks like nasty math, but it's actually pretty straightforward and pretty easy to work with here. It models the time or the rate, time between events that are unrelated. So each event does not build upon the next and uses a network performance or user request or system failures or messaging. And so basically your latency numbers are the uh, reciprocal of your arithmetic mean and then using E, uh, the exponential uh, number, raised to those various powers. Very straightforward this. Using that data from the example earlier, which had latency and arithmetic in here, latency for this, you can tell the numbers, but the probability density of something occurring at 158 milliseconds is 0.214%. Cumulative density, something uh, occurring within that 0 to 158 is 47.5. And the nice thing is that exponentials will also give you that median and keep in mind how powerful the median was around looking at changes for this. You can get an exponential median, in this case, 169.7. That's the median point. Same thing can happen with throughput. And so this is fairly straightforward. Now, honestly, keep in mind that these are aggregate average latencies themselves or aggregate average counts. You could use all of the data that's coming in and actually get more precise responses here. So I'm actually looking at the average of an average, the inferential structure of that data. 
But I want to bring this out, something really important for this. This is a pet peeve, very honestly. You may hear other people talk about this, that on scale, statistics are not your friend. Sorry, wrong. On scale, probability is not your friend. Statistics tell us the probability of something occurring. And on scale, the ability to say that the probability may occur scales up. But the statistics themselves are not impacted by scale of something happening for that. So let's start off by taking a quick look at this. And this is around coin flip probabilities. We've heard for years, coin flip probabilities are a 50-50 chance. Nope. Sorry. It actually depends on physics. When somebody flips this thing, there's a thing called precession, as well as a centralized wobble that happens into that. And this was proposed back in 2007 that coin flips were not 50-50. And so someone recruited all their friends and they sat down and they flipped 46 different currencies, did 350,000 flips and 50.8%, 51% landed with the starting side up. What it turns out is that the flipper makes a huge difference for this. People can actually learn to flip to land the same side up 10 out of 10 times, 100%. By the way, just in case you're thinking about this, there's also a difference between flipping and spinning the coin. So flipping almost always starts with the same side that you flip coming up being the side that, that faces up. The way to make it really random from the viewpoint is neither the person, um, neither of the people choosing a side they see the starting side. And so you can't see what it's going to be before you make your choice, nor can you change what it's going to be for that. Spinning, there's a difference in the weighting structure of most coins. Usually what we call the head side weighs more and it will tend to be the downward side. So flipping and spinning, neither one are perfect things. But there's even things that are kind of different. What this tells you is that Probability changes based on the data that we gather around that and the outside influences. And so there's this thing called the Bayes theorem. And Bayes theorem is heavily used and it's still argued about today. And this is called based on conditional probability. This basically the easiest way to describe this is something called the Monty Hall problem and the price is right. You have three doors. Behind one of those doors is a car. Behind the other two are goats. You pick door number one. The host shows you door number two. There's a goat behind it and offers to let you switch. Do you switch? Do you stay with where you are? Or does it make a difference? And this is still today argued about. Well, <laughs> it actually turns out that it's pretty important to be able to, to make the right choice. Bayes theorem says that your best odds, given that scenario, are to switch doors. And the reasoning behind it, simplified a little bit, is that when you have three blank doors, you have one third chance that the good thing is behind any of those doors. You pick a door that has a one third chance of having it. The other two doors added together are two thirds chances. You now remove one of those other two doors, but you haven't moved the vehicles around. So your first door, the one you picked, stays at one third. The third door now gets all two thirds of the remaining amount. So Bayes theorem basically gives you this mathematical method for bringing new data into here. And it can be used in predictive monitoring. You know that there's a 5% chance that uh, your application can crash on any given day. You start seeing memory uh, consumption increases. Bayes theorem says, based on the new data, you got a crash coming. Likewise, optimizing A-B testing, you can update the probabilities based on the loads of the feature service, and so on. Bayes theorem is incredibly important and gives you that backing to be able to say, hey, new data says this change has occurred. So coming towards the end here, let's talk a little bit about some of the common pitfalls that happen here. And we've talked about a few of these. First of it is, is ignoring scale. And ignoring scale basically says 
keeping in mind that we have a lot of data that are going on inside of here and picking the right data or looking at the wrong central measurement using arithmetic means as a way of looking at compounding elements here. Confusing correlation and causation, major headache for this. Likewise, getting causation backwards or not understanding causation's direction can also cause you problems. And then finally, failing to see those biases, whether they're survivorship biases or recency biases, failing to understand your biases can make your data um, invalid. So let's pick on correlation causation. So correlation and causation basically says these two things are, are related. Our correlation says they seem to be related. Causation says one influences the other. But for instance, US spending on science, space, and technology correlates almost exactly with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. I'm pretty convinced that they have nothing to do with each other for that. Um, likewise, you can show that the um, number of characters in the scripts US spelling bee correlates to the number of people killed by venomous spiders in the U.S. every year. Again, not going to convince me that there's any causation behind those pieces. Unfortunately, getting it backwards or that reverse correlation um, is one of them that's not, not fun. But the principal example is, for instance, it's well known. There's a correlation that drinking and depression are related. But does drinking cause depression? or does depression cause drinking? So there's not a clear causation line. They are definitely correlated. So keep this in mind when looking at that. So our summary. Statistics are how we tend to measure our metrics. We're measuring numbers. We're dealing with numbers here. They're aggregation. They're reduction to reveal central tendencies and patterns. They do not show individual behavior. That. And most of our choices make use of a very few basics, arithmetic mean, median, or percentile functionality, normal curves in here. But these other choices may give you some incredibly inferential results. And finally, the most effective debugging tool is still careful thought, coupled with judiciously placed print statements. Brian Kernigan said this in Unix for Beginners in 1979. It is just as true today. The difference is, is that our print statements now give us more insight, more data, more ability to look at, at predictions and trends than we had when we were simply working with print statements. And by the way, for those of you who um, uh, went to work on the data kind ninth data kind number, here's the result, all 42 digits of it. Uh, let me know if you got it right. Thanks. And thanks for listening to me today. You can find my slides on GitHub. Uh, you can find me on the Nginx community Slack out there. And you can always connect to me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn in Dave McAllister or Dave Mack. Thanks, and I appreciate your time today.